Lions, and indeed all of today's cats have a common ancestor that walked the earth 25 million years ago. Its name, Proilus lemonensis, meaning the first cat. With its body a similar size to domestic cats, this creature was the first step in the lineage that led to the African and Asian lions we see today. The Panthera genus, to which modern lions belong, diverged from the Felidae millions of years ago, likely originating in Central Asia. There is a debate about exactly how long ago this divergence occurred, but it could have been as early as 11 million years ago, or as recently as 1 million years ago. Either way, it was long after Australia split from the rest of Gondwana 99 million years ago. A reason for its unique wildlife, and a reason why lions don't live there. Instead, lions, Panthera leo, evolved throughout Africa and Eurasia. The oldest fossilized lion remains have been found in Tanzania and are thought to be around 2 million years old. During the Middle Pleistocene, African lions were widely distributed across the continent, but the changes in vegetation and climate that occurred throughout the Pleistocene separated lion populations. The growth of equatorial rainforest between 180,000 years ago and 80,000 years ago separated those living in East and Southern Africa from those in the North and West. As the Sahara Desert expanded between 80,000 and 27,000 years ago, western and northern lions became separated. As rainforest declined and gave way to open grasslands, lions moved from west to central Africa. The North African lions dispersed into southern Europe and Asia. The following extinctions of the lions from the European, North African, and Middle Eastern populations limited gene flow between African and Asian lions the only two subspecies of lions left today. So, lions have had a long and turbulent history, and those that survive today are the hardest of the species. But could they survive in Australia, a land where desert covers 18% of its land mass, where average annual rainfall is only 419 millimeters, or 16 inches, and where the hottest temperature recorded in the country hit almost 51 degrees Celsius, or 123 degrees Fahrenheit. If we first look at lions' diets, lions are generalist hypercarnivores. That means that they survive on meat alone. They are adapted to take down prey larger than themselves, hunting alone or in their prides. They are camouflaged within their environment. Their sharp teeth and claws help to latch onto prey, and their speed and agility help them to outrun even the most nimble of antelopes. They are well-adapted apex predators. They hunt a wide variety of prey, mostly ungulates. In Africa, these include zebra, wildebeest, antelope, and buffalo. They have also been observed hunting giraffes and even juvenile elephants. They will also take down warthogs, although these are generally considered too small for a lion to gain enough nutrition from. In India, lions often hunt samba deer and spotted chittle deer. In Australia, there are no native ungulates, but there are plenty that have been introduced to the continent over the past few centuries. Captain Cook introduced several species of placental mammals to Australia in 1770. These ranged from rodents to deer. In fact, six species of non-native deer roam wild in Australia. These include the same samba and chittle deer that lions prey on in India. They also include European fallow deer and red deer. Many of these species are considered pests as they destroy vegetation and a range of habitats. Total deer populations have exploded recently, from 200,000 in 2002 to between 1 and 2 million in 2022. If left unmanaged, their population can increase by 30 to 50 percent every year. Wildlife officials are trying to manage their numbers. It seems if lions were introduced to Australia, there would be plenty for them to eat. The habitats favored by the deer are mostly forested, with some venturing out into the open. Asiatic lions prefer hunting in closed habitats, so this would suit them. Red deer weigh similar to wildebeest, and the heaviest males are a similar weight to smaller zebras. Lions would be able to take down Australia's invasive deer and could thrive in their large numbers. Other species that could be considered prey for introduced lions are wild buffaloes, these two were introduced to Australia in the 1800s. Today, more than 160,000 roam the Northern Territory and are having a major impact on the environment. 
privately hired musterers round up and export thousands to be exported to Southeast Asia. There have also been calls to help reduce the buffalo populations, but neither of these is having any impact on their growing population. Perhaps lions could solve the problem? It seems, from a dietary perspective, lions would do very well in Australia. But what about the habitat and climate on offer for them? Could they survive this? South Africa, where 13,000 lions reside, has an arid, hot, and cold desert towards the west and center, and a more temperate climate towards the east. The temperate climate is where South Africa's largest populations of lions reside, in the Kruger National Park. Lions typically inhabit grassy plains and savannas, and regions where annual rainfall averages 300 to 1,500 millimeters, or 12 to 59 inches. Temperatures in Kruger typically range between 5 and 35 degrees Celsius, or 43 and 91 degrees Fahrenheit. Due to its immense size, the Australian continent has a huge variety of climates and habitats, some of which would be suitable for lions. Most of Australia comprises desert or semi-arid regions. However, there are small areas of temperate climate in the southeast and southwest fringes. In the north, a tropical climate dominates with grasslands and deserts. This has a dry and rainy season, much like that of South Africa. Rainfall fluctuates massively depending on the region. In the center where it is incredibly hot and arid, rainfall would be too little to sustain lions. Areas that would fall within the range of rainfall that South Africa's lions are used to include the south, east coast, and parts of the north. Although the far north could be considered too wet as it can exceed 3,000 millimeters or 120 inches annually, in Darwin in the north, temperatures average 28 degrees Celsius or 82 degrees Fahrenheit. In the east, temperatures are milder at around 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Certain climates within Australia would be suitable for lions. Today, they live in more than 20 different African countries with a very small population in India's Gear National Park. The climates of each of these countries vary, but lions have found a home there. Australia could provide the right sort of climate and habitat for lions. There are millions of square miles of protected areas across Australia. There are over 80 national parks and reserves in the Northern Territory alone. With Kakadu National Park being the largest in Australia, one of the biggest savannas in the world is the Australian tropical savanna biome which covers an area of more than 140,000 square miles in Australia's north. In conclusion, we believe that lions could survive in Australia. It seems that there would be plenty of food for a healthy population of lions to live off, and there are certainly some areas with the right type of climate and habitat for lions to live in. Of course, introducing a top predator like a lion could wreak havoc on the ecosystem. The introduced species already posing problems for Australia's wildlife such as deer, buffalo, and rabbits thrive because there are no natural land predators for them in Australia. Introducing one of the world's most successful predators to Australia would certainly shake things up a bit. Dingoes, introduced to Australia about 5,000 years ago, have been blamed for the extinction of Tasmanian devils and the Tasmanian wolf on Australia's mainland. Although this theory has since been debunked, it shows just how fragile an ecosystem can be, and the introduction of a foreign predator could prove disastrous. Having said that, seeing lions in Australia's outback would be an incredible sight. Sub-Saharan Africa is home to the second heaviest land mammal in the world, the hippopotamus. Their dense bodies make it impossible for them to swim, even though they spend most of their time in the water. The name hippopotamus derives from the Greek term for river horse, Indeed, hippos enjoy freshwater habitats like no other land mammal because of their semi-aquatic nature. The body of the hippopotamus is well suited for aquatic life. Their eyes, ears, and nostrils are located at the top of their head so they can see, hear, and breathe while mostly submerged. A clear membrane covers and protects their eyes while allowing them to see underwater. Their nostrils close to keep water out and they can hold their breath for several minutes. Staying underwater helps the hippopotamus not feel the weight of its hulking frame. They can weigh up to 3,600 kilograms or 8,000 pounds. Hippos are native to Africa, but here we ask the question, could hippos survive in Australia? In order to determine whether this would be possible, 
we need to consider their natural diet, habitat, and climate and compare these to what's available in Australia. Firstly, let's look at their diet. Hippos are herbivores and feed on a variety of plant species, including grasses, sedges, reeds, and other aquatic vegetation. Their diet may vary depending on exactly where they live and the species of vegetation available to them. Some hippos feed primarily on grasses, whereas others eat larger amounts of aquatic plants. These can include water hyacinths, water lettuce, and water lilies. Hippos come out of the water at night to feed. Sometimes they travel great distances to find their preferred vegetation. They are known as grazers and can eat as much as 100 pounds or 43 kilograms of plant matter each night. They also eat plants in the water where they spend most of their time in the day. In Australia, there would likely be enough suitable vegetation for hippos. Both water hyacinth and water lettuce grow there. They are, however, invasive species, and in some places, this vegetation is clogging up the waterways. Some local authorities are taking measures to try and remove them from rivers and lakes. They grow in northern Australia where the climate is warm and wet. Introducing hippos to these waterways could certainly keep the unwanted vegetation down, and there would be plenty for them to eat. Hippos are well adapted to their diet. Their lips are wide and tough to help them rip up vegetation from the ground. Their large teeth crush the plant matter before swallowing it. They have a long digestive tract which allows them to absorb as much nutrition from the plant matter as possible. While hippos can consume a large quantity of food each day, they are also able to go without food for several days if necessary. Interestingly, hippos can consume food both on land and underwater, where they can hold their breath for several minutes. They may even walk along the bottom of rivers and lakes to reach aquatic plants. They would likely be able to survive in certain parts of Australia where the lush vegetation that makes up their diet thrives. But there is more than just food when we consider if an animal can live in a certain location. So, let's look at habitat. Hippos are semi-aquatic animals. Their natural habitat includes many slow-moving or still bodies of fresh water. They can be found in rivers, lakes, and swamps. Common hippos are native to sub-Saharan Africa, with the pygmy hippo inhabiting West Africa. As long as there is plentiful water, they can live in a range of habitats from open savannas to rainforests. Hippos spend much of their time in the water because they use it to regulate their body temperature and protect their skin from the sun. Hippos prefer water sources that are deep enough to fully submerge themselves, with muddy banks that they can use to exit and enter the water. They are well adapted to life in the water, with streamlined bodies, webbed feet, and the ability to hold their breath for several minutes. But does Australia have these kinds of freshwater habitats to enable hippos to live there? Australia has a rich diversity of freshwater ecosystems that are home to a wide range of species, some of which are found nowhere else in the world. Many rivers and streams vary in size and characteristics. Some of the most famous rivers include the Murray-Darling River system, the Fitzroy River in Western Australia, and the Franklin River in Tasmania. The Murray River is the country's largest river and flows through southeastern Australia. It is a slow-moving river that is preferred by hippos. The slower-moving bodies of water often provide the aquatic plants that hippos are so fond of. The Murray River in Australia, particularly in the lower reaches, creates important habitats for a variety of aquatic plants and animals. In some parts of Africa, Hippos are known to live exclusively in lakes, where they can form large groups or pods that may number in the dozens or even hundreds. There are many natural and man-made lakes and reservoirs in Australia. Some of the largest natural lakes include Lake Eyre, Lake Torrens, and Lake Frome in South Australia. Lake Eyre is located in the northern part of South Australia and, despite being the largest lake in Australia, would not be suitable for hippos. Not only does it contain salt water, but its size can fluctuate dramatically depending on the amount of rainfall and the flow of the rivers that feed it. When it is full, Lake Eyre has a surface area of over three and a half thousand square miles, making it one of the largest saltwater lakes in the world. However, it is often much smaller than this, and during times of extended drought, it can dry up almost completely. 
leaving behind a vast expanse of salt flats. This is also true of Lake Torrens and Lake Frome. They are also saltwater lakes and often dry up during drought. Saltwater is much denser and contains much higher levels of salt than freshwater. This can make it difficult for hippos to maintain the proper balance of fluids and electrolytes in their bodies. Exposure to salt water can cause dehydration and even death in hippos, as their kidneys are not equipped to efficiently filter out excess salt from their bodies. Hippos would not be able to survive in Australia's saltwater lakes. However, Australia has many freshwater lakes that are scattered across the country. Located in the far north of Western Australia, Lake Argyle is a unique and important ecosystem that supports a wide variety of plant and animal species adapted to the hot and dry conditions of the Kimberley region of Western Australia. Freshwater crocodiles and a huge variety of fish and birds can be found in and around Lake Argyle. Lakes like this could provide a potential habitat for hippos. Lastly, let's consider the climate. Hippos are well adapted to the hot and humid climate of Sub-Saharan Africa. They have several adaptations that allow them to cope with the unique environmental conditions of their habitat. Their skin is known to secrete a natural sunscreen that protects them against the sun. It is also incredibly tough and protects them from waterborne parasites. Their large size helps them to retain heat and conserve energy in cooler temperatures. It also makes them formidable animals and less prone to predatory attacks from animals that also call Africa home. Their eyes, ears, and noses are located towards the top of their heads which allows them to see, hear, and breathe whilst remaining almost entirely submerged. Because they are so reliant on and adapted to water, they would not survive in dry regions. Australia is the driest inhabited continent. South Australia is the driest state in Australia and sees regular droughts. Rainfall in Australia is greatest in the far north and in some small pockets along the east coast. However, overall, Australia experiences far less rainfall than some of the African countries where hippos are native. In Africa, the rainy season fills the rivers, lakes, and dams where hippos thrive. In Australia, is it likely that there isn't enough rainfall over a great enough area for hippos? In conclusion, we feel that although there would probably be enough vegetation for hippos in Australia, there may not be enough freshwater sources or a suitable climate. Freshwater lakes and rivers certainly do exist in Australia, but they seem to be less abundant than in sub-Saharan Africa. The climate, although warm and wet in small pockets of the country, seems largely to be too dry for hippos to thrive. Introducing hippos to Australia could have detrimental effects on the local ecosystem. As an invasive species, hippos could disrupt the balance of native flora and fauna compete with other herbivores for food, and potentially damage aquatic habitats. Although this is theoretically possible for hippos to survive in Australia with human intervention and modifications to the environment, it is not a practical or ethical solution. Introducing non-native species to an ecosystem can have far-reaching consequences, and it is generally best to focus on conservation efforts for native species instead. Wolves are some of the most iconic predators in the animal kingdom. They're featured in songs, legends, and even modern films. Although the gray wolf is the most recognizable, there are more than 30 distinct subspecies that range across the northern hemisphere. These dedicated pack animals hunt together, roam together, and play together, all while maintaining an important role in their local ecosystem. Wolves are large, four-legged, carnivorous mammals. They have pointed ears, elongated snouts, and bushy tails that curl behind them as a means of expression, although there are many different subspecies with their own unique coloring. Most wolves share the same rough, thick fur with either a gray or beige pattern. In many cases, the animal's natural coloring will match the landscape that they need to blend in with. The average wolf typically weighs somewhere between 80 and 160 pounds, or 36 to 72 kilograms. Females are usually smaller than their male counterparts, often by as much as 40 pounds or 18 kilograms. Most wolves are about 4 to 6 feet long, or 1.2 to 1.8 meters, and stand roughly 2 to 3 feet high, or 60 to 90 centimeters. One of the largest wolves ever killed was killed in Alaska in 1975. 
he weighed an impressive total of 175 pounds, or 80 kilograms. Wolves are animals that are native to the Northern Hemisphere and can be found in Europe, Asia, and North America. They like to live in habitats with plenty of game, cover, and room to roam. However, they are not limited to any one kind of terrain. This is why you'll see wolves in Arctic tundras, mountains, forests, plains, and nearly every other kind of northern environment. Due to their large size and the thickness of their fur, most wolves prefer to live in cold climates, so you're unlikely to ever see one in the southern parts of their respective continents. The social structure of a wolf pack is one of the most fascinating that has ever been observed. They have a very strict level of hierarchy that has to be adhered to by all of the members of the pack. This may sound harsh initially, but it is a method that allows these packs of wolves to be able to survive. The leader of the pack is the alpha male, and his mate is the beta female. Many believe that the social order of a pack is determined by fear and dominance of the one in charge. However, it isn't necessarily established by an attack on one, and the winner is the leader. It is much more complex than that. Through careful research, experts have found that this type of social structure helps to promote unity and social order. It also helps to reduce conflicts and to lower the chances of aggressive behaviors occurring among the members of the pack. The upper level of social structure doesn't change very often. However, it can a little bit at the lower levels. Living in a pack not only facilitates the raising and feeding of pups, coordinated and collaborative hunting, and the defense of territory, but it also allows for the formation of many unique emotional bonds between pack members, the foundation for cooperative living. It is during a hunt when cooperation between wolves within a pack is most apparent. Wolves are opportunists. They test their prey, sensing any weakness or vulnerability through visual cues and even through hearing and scent. Contrary to ambush predators that rely on the element of surprise and a short and intense burst of energy to secure their prey, wolves are an endurance or coursing predators. They chase their prey, often over long distances, sometimes even a few miles, to find the right animal or opportunity. On the hunt, wolves work together with certain individuals typically carrying out their specific roles in the hunt, often based on age, gender, and social standing. These animals are carnivores and will eat nearly any type of prey that they can catch. With that said, they typically prey on large hoofed animals like deer, elk, moose, sheep, goats, and bison. When large prey is not available, wolves are likely to catch smaller mammals like rabbits or beavers. An adult needs to eat about 5 to 7 pounds of meat every day to maintain a healthy weight. Typically, a pack will kill a single large mammal and survive off the meat for several days before moving on to the next opportunity. The average wolf eats the equivalent of 15 deer across an entire year. This is why packs need to maintain such large territories to survive. Wolves are apex predators, which means that they are at the top of the food chain within their designated territories. Still, they stick together in packs for good reason. There are plenty of bigger, meaner animals who are willing to consider them as prey. In general, these animals need to watch out for bears and large cats like tigers or mountain lions. When they work together, a pack can take down a polar bear, but a wolf alone might not be so lucky. The actual biggest threat to any wolf is human interaction. They often get shot by poachers, licensed hunters, and farmers who are attempting to protect their livestock. These animals also suffer from climate change caused by deforestation. When humans move in, their territory gets smaller, reducing their prey options and making survival difficult. The human presence is often credited as the reason for the drastic decline in wolf presence across North America over the last 100 years. As you can see, wolves are great hunters and have amazing qualities, but can they cope in Australia? Australia doesn't have a native wolf, unless you count the dingo, which are feral dogs that were most likely brought to the continent about 50,000 years ago with the first human settlers. There was a species of marsupial predator called thylacine, which sometimes is called the Tasmanian wolf or Tasmanian tiger, due to stripes on its hindquarters. 
These animals bore resemblance to canines due to convergent evolution. Unfortunately, the species was declared extinct in the 1930s due to overhunting and programs to protect sheep herds in Australia. In recent years, there have been some questionable sightings that indicate a population of thylacines may have survived. But for now, science considers them to be extinct. If introduced into the mountain regions of New South Wales and Victoria, wolves would probably survive. The temperatures are more moderate and there is generally more rain than the interior. That may not be the case though with climate change. Plus, there is a huge deer population for them to feed on. In fact, deer in most states in Australia are out of control and game rules no longer apply to them. They can be shot on sight any time of the year. Apart from deer, there are feral dogs, feral goats, and kangaroos. However, hunting kangaroos would not be a very easy task. Kangaroo has a type of locomotion that the canines have never seen before. They are also very fast, can travel up to 80 kilometers an hour, and have tremendous acceleration getting there very quickly and are probably the fastest animal over rough and rocky terrain and up hills where they can bound very easily. Nothing can match them over long distances. They can also chew on feral horses in the southern alpine regions, so there's plenty of food and enough water for them. However, introducing predators typically end up being more of a problem than a solution. Invasive species are already a serious problem in Australia. Wolves may have a harmful impact on many other native populations, especially some that are already vulnerable. Now that you've heard our opinion, we want to know yours. What do you think would happen if wolves migrated to Australia? We're waiting for your answers in the comments. Australia is a land like no other. Due to its separation from the great supercontinent Gondwana 99 million years ago, and its complete isolation from any other landmass 30 million years ago. For this reason, its natural history has developed in isolation from the rest of the world, evolving unique species that are found nowhere else on Earth. Whilst migration across continents occurred elsewhere, and species evolved from one continent to the next, leaving traces of their ancestral past, the same cannot be said for Australia. In fact, 90% of Australia's mammals are only found there and nowhere else on the planet. Some of its strangest and most unique animals include the egg-laying mammal, the duck-billed platypus, the cassowary, the echidna, the Tasmanian devil, and, of course, kangaroos. There are no natural land predators in Australia, except for venomous snakes and spiders, which don't actively hunt Australia's larger terrestrial wildlife. Only dingoes pose a threat. These were introduced some 5,000 years ago by Asian seafarers and are now considered Australia's apex terrestrial predator. Of course, enter the water and you'll have the likes of freshwater and saltwater crocodiles, box jellyfish, and an array of shark species to answer to. But on land, that's not the case. Here, we ask the question, could hyenas survive in Australia? Let's look at where and how hyenas survive in their native countries to find out if they could make Australia their home. Hyenas are often portrayed as being dim-witted scavengers of the African savannas, but in reality, they are highly intelligent animals and exceptional hunters capable of taking down prey much larger than themselves. They display many canine characteristics, which give the impression that they are closely related to dogs. This includes their terrestrial lifestyle, inability to climb trees, catching prey with their teeth rather than their claws, and their feet which are adept at running with non-retractable claws. But look a little closer, and scientists consider them more closely related to felines, the cats, their grooming behavior, scent marking, and mating, and parental techniques are far more cat-like than dog-like, and they are considered feliform, like other cats. There are four extant species of hyena. The striped hyena lives in North Africa and parts of Asia, the aardwolf in East and Southern Africa, the brown hyena in parts of Southern Africa, and the spotted hyena across much of sub-Saharan Africa. The most common species is the spotted hyena, which we will focus on for this video. They are highly sociable carnivores who live in groups called clans. These can consist of as many as 80 individuals. There are complex social interactions that occur in these clans, in a hierarchy with females typically dominating over males. 
Their social complexities have been likened to some of the primates, with the ability to make social decisions based on the knowledge of others in the group. They understand that some of their clan members may be more reliable than others and can identify distant kin and form ally networks. They wouldn't be able to maintain these complex social bonds if they weren't highly intelligent animals. They are more successful hunters than lions and typically prey on wildebeest, zebra, and Thompson's gazelles, as well as giraffes, kudu, and gimsbok. They can hunt individually or as a group and have been recorded taking down baby elephants in Cape Buffalo. If they were to live in Australia, hyenas may consider the likes of kangaroos as their typical prey. These marsupials are abundant throughout Australia, where there are said to be more than 50 million. Some Australians refer to the kangaroo populations as plague-like proportions, so introducing hyenas could help bring down their numbers. Another animal that some in Australia consider to be a pest is the goat. Since goats were introduced to Australia with the first fleet in 1788, they have multiplied, escaped, and become feral. Today, feral populations of goats amount to more than 2.3 million. They live in the harsh Australian climate, thriving on sparse vegetation and limited water sources, but they could provide significant food for hyenas if their habitats were to overlap. Goats aren't the only feral animals whose numbers have skyrocketed and that are now considered pests. Australia has the world's largest population of feral horses. Some 400,000 wild horses now occupy parts of the Australian Alps, Kosciuszko National Park, parts of Queensland, and the Northern Territory and Western Australia. These would be akin to zebras, which hyenas are highly skilled at taking down in Africa. It seems between Australia's natural wildlife and introduced species, there would be enough food for a sizable population of hyenas to survive. But what about Australia's habitat and climate? Could hyenas survive these conditions? Are they comparable to those found in Sub-Saharan Africa? Spotted hyenas are an incredibly flexible and adaptable species. Their ability to hunt both alone and as groups gives them distinct advantages that other predators don't possess but they are also adaptable when it comes to habitat. They occupy a broad range of habitats across sub-Saharan Africa. They are found in semi-deserts, savanna, open woodland, dense dry woodland, and mountainous forests up to 4,000 meters in altitude. Their cousins, the striped and brown hyenas, are more suited to desert and semi-desert conditions. In Australia, these kinds of habitats exist across the country. In fact, Almost a quarter of Australia's land mass is covered in savanna. The Australian savanna covers parts of the northern section of Western Australia, the Northern Territory, and higher parts of Queensland. It is characterized by large open grasslands dotted with small trees and shrubs. Whilst a large population of feral horses that could be considered hyena prey live in Kosciuszko National Park, the climate there would likely be too cold for hyenas. It is an unusual alpine region on Australia's mainland containing Australia's highest peak, Mount Kosciuszko. However, there are also wild horses living on Australia's savannas. Not only these, but the savannas are also home to the likes of eastern grey kangaroos and wallabies that would provide food for a population of hyenas on the open grasslands. Other habitats within Australia include deserts and semi-deserts, which cover about a fifth of Australia. It is the driest inhabited continent on Earth. More than 80% of Australia receives less than 24 inches of rainfall each year, and some places receive only 3 inches. Some of the desert regions may receive too little rainfall to sustain a population of hyenas, but on their fringes and near water sources, spotted hyenas are likely to be able to exist. Australian forests cover approximately one-fifth of the mainland, situated mostly on the fringes of the continent, particularly in the north and the east they could offer a habitat for hyenas. In Africa, hyenas live in open woodland and dense dry woodland. Only a small pocket of dry woodland exists in New South Wales, so there may not be enough coverage for hyenas to occupy that particular region. But with a broad range of other habitats to offer, it seems hyenas would likely have enough territory in which to survive, and it may not be a case of just surviving in Australia. Hyenas could potentially thrive there. With no large predators to compete with them, they would have access to all the prey species on the mainland. On the Serengeti in Africa, hyenas outnumber lions 3 to 1. 
They are mortal enemies. Both species scavenge carcasses and will fight for their rights to the meal. Usually, lions will dominate a carcass and hyenas will have to wait their turn. This is mostly due to the larger size of the lions and their greater numbers across a carcass. But when smaller carcasses are available, typically hyenas are first to find it and manage to consume it before lions do. They are experts at sniffing out dead animals. The presence of both of these top predators within the same environment causes conflict and dictates the animal's behaviors to some degree. When the lions are present, hyenas adapt their hunting to be more diurnal, avoiding their most fearsome competitor at nighttime. However, when lions are not within the territory, hyenas become solely nocturnal. In Australia, there would be no predators to compete with. Dingoes are far smaller than hyenas and typically prey on rabbits. Before the introduction of rabbits to the Australian mainland, dingoes primarily fed on wallabies and kangaroos, and so could have been considered competitors for hyenas. Dingoes are already thought to be responsible for the demise and extinction of the Tasmanian wolf and Tasmanian devil on the mainland through competition for food. But they would be unlikely to compete with hyenas, who would hunt larger prey. With all things considered, we believe that hyenas could survive in Australia. They would likely have enough native and introduced prey species to satiate their appetite. The diverse habitats across Australia would support their lifestyle, and the climate in some parts is comparable to parts of sub-Saharan Africa. With no competition from large land predators like lions, hyenas would likely thrive in Australia. The cheetah is one of the most graceful members of the cat family and one of the few cat species which relies on speed instead of stealth when hunting. Cheetahs are the fastest land mammals on Earth, reaching speeds of 110 to 120 kilometers an hour. They accelerate from 0 to 80 kilometers an hour in just 3 seconds, which is faster than a lot of sports cars. Cheetahs have slender, long-legged bodies with blunt, semi-retractable claws. Their heads are small with high-set eyes. A black tear mark runs from the inner corner of each eye down to the mouth. A cheetah's teeth are small when compared with other big cats, which accommodates their larger nasal passages that enable quick air intake. Cheetah's spots may serve as camouflage for both hunting and hiding. Their spots may offset the shadows in the gray-hued grasses they often inhabit, allowing them to blend in with their surroundings. Camouflage is essential not only for stalking prey, but also for protecting cheetah cubs from predators. A cheetah cub's smoky gray mantle may serve as added camouflage among the dead grasses. Much like a human fingerprint, a cheetah spots in the ring pattern of its tail are unique, enabling researchers in the field to identify individuals. Adult cheetah males are typically larger than females. Body lengths of cheetahs range from 112 to 150 centimeters, or 3.93 to 4.92 feet. Tail lengths are between 60 to 80 centimeters, or 2 to 2.62 feet. And the height at the shoulder ranges from 67 to 92 centimeters, or 2.2 to 3.1 feet. Their weights average from 21 to 72 kilograms, or 46 to 158 pounds. The cheetah is an animal that once had a vast historical range that stretched across several continents, but their distribution today is much more scattered, with a small number found in Iran and the majority found in sub-Saharan Africa. Although cheetahs are still found in a few different spots of eastern and southern Africa, the highest population of wild cheetah is now found in Nambia in southwestern Africa. Cheetahs are most commonly found stalking prey in the vast, open grasslands, but they are also found in a variety of other habitats as well, including deserts, dense vegetation, and mountainous terrain, providing that there are both adequate supplies of food and water. Cheetahs are one of Africa's most vulnerable felines, with population numbers mainly affected by growing human settlements that encroach on their native habitats. Cheetahs have a unique social order among phalids. Adult females are solitary, while adult males are not. Adult females interact with adult males only long enough to breed, and females raise their cubs on their own. At 18 months, the mother leaves the cubs, who then form a sibling group that stays together for another six months. At about two years, the female siblings leave the group and become solitary. 
while the young males remain together for life in a group called a coalition. A coalition is usually made up of two to three litter mates and is a very tightly bonded group. Singleton males are not common and usually do not survive long. This coalition may live and hunt together for life, claiming a territory, which may encompass several female home ranges. Like other phalids, cheetahs are carnivorous, getting food by killing and eating other animals. The teeth of cats are well suited to their diet, with long canines for gripping prey and blade-like molars for cutting flesh. While most cats are nocturnal predators, the cheetahs primarily diurnal, hunting in the early morning and late afternoon. Since it depends on sight rather than smell, it likes to scan the wild from a tree limb or the top of a termite mound. Other big cats chase only a few hundred meters, but the cheetah chases 5.5 kilometers at an average speed of 72 kilometers per hour. The energy cheetahs spend on going after their prey makes one wonder if they gain the energy after the feed. However, cheetahs have a very refined approach to hunting, probably to avoid being unsuccessful. A cheetah's night vision is poor compared to others in the big cat kingdom. It is the only big cat that hunts during the day. This poses some unique challenges for the cheetah, as it does not have the cover of darkness to enable it to spring a surprise attack on its prey. A cheetah spends the mornings and early evenings looking for prey when there is light but low sun. To hunt under the heat of the sun would be extremely challenging for the cheetah, given the energy it needs to expend to catch its meal. Cheetahs typically hunt zebra, wildebeest, and gazelle. These are all herd animals and all take turns to look out for danger. So the stealthy cheetah assassin must use its wits as well as its lightning speed to have the best chance of getting a kill. A cheetah will always approach its prey from a downward position, so its scent does not give them away. It uses the natural undulations and peaks of its habitat, such as hills and termite mounds, to cover as it approaches. A cheetah has to stay out of sight until it's time to pounce. Once a cheetah spots prey, it stalks the prey. Tall grass is essential here. Fortunately for the cheetah, the places where its favorite prey gathers to drink are typically surrounded by tall grasses. Using the tall grass for cover and its spots as camouflage, it silently approaches its prey, treading softly and slowly to avoid detection. Although the cheetah is the fastest land animal in the world, it is not capable of prolonged chases, so it needs to position itself as close to its prey as possible before it decides to make an ambush. Once close enough, the cheetah uses its electrifying speed to launch a surprise ambush. Once it is in sight, its prey will bolt, so the cheetah has to chase down any laggers before it's exhausted. If a cheetah times its hunt well, its raw speed means that it will quickly catch something. Cheetahs can hit speeds of 71 miles per hour and using their long tails for balance. So once the hunt is on, it has a 1 in 10 chance of getting a kill. Once a cheetah subdues its prey, it may begin eating the prey before the prey is dead. This is to reduce the chances of a scavenger, such as a hyena, or a larger big cat like a lion or leopard, coming along and robbing it of the prize it worked so hard to win. Cheetahs are in trouble in the wild. In the last century, the cheetah population has declined from 100,000 to fewer than 8,000 individuals, and the species has become extinct in at least 13 countries. Technically, cheetahs don't have any predators. However, lions, leopards, and hyenas will try to prey upon cheetah, particularly cheetah cubs. Because they are so fast, adult cheetahs are very difficult to catch. Cubs are a different story. When first born, like all kittens, they are utterly helpless and can easily be killed in their nursery den while their mother is off hunting. The mortality rate of cheetah cubs is incredibly high, approximately 70%, and most of those fatalities are non-lion related. This has led many to wonder what would happen if cheetahs were relocated to other places, such as Australia. Could they survive? Cheetahs could potentially kill kangaroos and provide more competition in a continent that's content with kangaroos just not having any dangerous scenarios they can experience. Cheetahs would become apex predators and probably thrive in the continent of Australia as well as provide balance so that kangaroos weren't just doing whatever they wanted.
Even though cheetahs may survive in Australia, introducing predators typically end up being more of a problem than a solution. Australia already has major invasive species issues. Introducing cheetahs may help with controlling kangaroo populations, but may negatively affect a lot of other native populations, including ones that are already vulnerable. It's unlikely that cheetahs would only hunt and kill kangaroos, improbable that they would kill other species that are already threatened and endangered as well. Meanwhile, there are lots of things in Australia that can kill you. They even have poisonous toads. Cheetahs would be unfamiliar with these creatures and thus much more likely to fall victim to them. Leopards, or Panthera pardus, are one of five species from the genus Panthera. This genus includes other big cats, lions, tigers, jaguars, and snow leopards. Leopards appear stockier than other big cats, with relatively short legs and broad heads. They stand about 28 inches at the shoulder and weigh on average 100 pounds, or 45 kilograms. They are one of the smallest big cats. Their fur is a yellow cream color with distinct black rosette spots. This makes them incredibly well camouflaged in trees and dense foliage. Their color and markings can vary across the globe depending on the habitat. Those living in the African savanna have lighter colored coats than those living in the rainforest. Melanistic black leopards are known as black panthers. Leopards are powerful cats. They can jump 10 feet into the air and leap 20 feet forwards. They can run at 36 miles per hour and can hunt prey much larger than themselves. They are nocturnal hunters that use their strength to haul prey up into the relative safety of trees. There, they are less likely to lose their kill to scavengers and other predators. They eat antelope, warthogs, guinea fowl, and rodents to name a few. They are adapted to a variety of different habitats and have been around for a very long time. Fossil remains of leopards have been dated back to the early Pleistocene, approximately 600,000 years ago. Their range is the most widespread of all the big cats, occupying niches in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, including China, India, and Eastern Russia. Leopards do not live in Australia. Of some 300 mammal species found in Australia, nearly 90% of them are unique to the country or continent. The reason for this lies within the timing of the continent's separation from Antarctica and Greater India. Australia became isolated from the rest of the world before big cats even existed. As Australia moved towards Indonesia, some animals such as bats could fly a relatively short distance into Australia and establish themselves there. Others, such as rodents, drifted across the sea on debris and landed in Australia. Big cats, however, could not make the journey. Tigers were once present on the Indonesian island of Bali, but never moved further east towards Australia. Australia did once have a predatory cat-like animal. It was called the marsupial lion. As the name suggests, this was not a true lion or cat. Instead, it was a marsupial, like kangaroos, koalas, and wombat. It was a similar size to female lions or tigers. The unusual animal was a ferocious predator that became extinct shortly after the arrival of the first humans in Australia. We know that Australia has its own distinctive flora and fauna, owing to its isolation from the rest of the world. But could leopards survive there? Are the habitat and climate suitable? Are there enough prey species? And would they be under threat from predators or in competition with any of Australia's unique animals? Leopards occupy a broad range of habitats, from deserts and arid regions to savannas, grasslands, and lush rainforests. Their tolerance for a wide variety of habitats is a reason for this species' success and its widespread range across the globe. Leopards are the only big cat species to live in both deserts and rainforests. In Australia, these habitats also exist. Leopards would feel at home in the vast arid regions of any of Australia's 10 deserts. It could survive in the rainforest in the country's northern and northeastern tips. It could thrive amongst the temperate grassland savannas in the southeast. Forested areas would provide ample cover for this elusive cat. 
the Great Western Woodlands in the country's west, or the Mediterranean Woodlands to the south, provide both shelter and an abundance of prey species. Leopards are also at home in mountainous regions such as the foothills of Mount Kenya in Africa. Australia offers incredibly diverse mountainous landscapes, from the scenic Blue Mountains and beautiful Flinders Range to the snow-capped mountains of the Australian Alps. Less than 10% of Australia's landmass is made up of mountain ranges, but this rugged terrain and isolated wilderness would offer refuge to leopards if they were introduced there. As well as a variety of different habitats, Australia also offers many different climates. It is the driest inhabited continent on Earth. More than 80% of Australia receives less than 24 inches of rain each year, and some places receive only 3 inches of rain. Some of the desert regions would be too hot and too dry for leopards to survive, but they could live on the fringes of these deserts or where there were water sources nearby. The temperate, tropical, and subtropical regions, however, could provide the necessary rainfall for both leopards and their prey to thrive. Leopards feed on multiple prey species. They are able to hunt different animals depending on their habitat. In grassland savannas, they hunt medium-sized ungulates such as antelope. In the mountains, they feed on rock hyrax and porcupines. And in the rainforest, they catch small antelope and primates. Being excellent swimmers, leopards also catch fish and, when food is scarce, they will eat rodents and beetles too. In Australia, there are no wild primates or native hoofed animals. Black buck antelope were introduced in the early 1900s and are now considered a pest. There wouldn't be enough roaming free for them to be considered prey for leopards. It is likely that leopards would adapt their hunting strategies to prey on some of Australia's marsupials. Kangaroos, wallabies, wombats, and koalas could all be considered potential prey for a hungry leopard. Smaller animals such as possums and rodents could also be hunted by leopards. One animal that leopards would be familiar with in Australia is the crocodile. In their native habitat, they sometimes compete with crocodiles for prey and space. They have been shown to actively hunt and kill crocodiles in Africa, so they would likely do the same in Australia. As well as the availability of prey species, we need to consider the competition that leopards may face. In Australia, leopards would find competition from dingoes. These wild dogs are Australia's top land predators. They were introduced to Australia by Asian seafarers about 4,000 years ago. Dingoes occupy a similar habitat to leopards. They are found in deserts and coastal regions, forests and rainforests, temperate moorlands, highlands and wetlands. In Africa, leopards live side by side with lions, cheetahs, wild dogs, and hyenas. These predators all occupy a similar niche and prey on the same species. If leopards were introduced to Australia, perhaps they could live side by side with dingoes. There would likely be enough mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles for the big cats to feed off and plenty of space for them to establish their own territories. The biggest threat to leopards, if they lived in Australia, would likely be humans. In some places, like South Africa and India, leopards live in close proximity to cities and urban areas. They can be found near Johannesburg and Mumbai in these countries. Leopards are in sharp decline across the world. They are poached for their beautiful fur and body parts, which are used in traditional Asian medicine. Their habitats have been destroyed by human activity, building and urbanization, and wildfires. There is a risk that fragmented populations of leopards could be lost altogether. If they were allowed to roam Australia, would they face similar perils? And what of the local fauna already found there? Introducing a new apex predator that prey species aren't familiar with could wreak havoc on the fragile ecosystem. Although we believe leopards could survive in Australia, there is a reason why they aren't there. We must try to preserve the habitats and ecosystems in which they do live and help this species thrive so that it can be enjoyed by generations to come. The cougar, which is also commonly referred to as a puma, mountain lion, or panther, is the second largest cat in North America. Unlike other big cats, however, the cougar cannot roar. Instead, the large feline purrs like a house cat. 
cougars also have similar body types to house cats, only on a larger scale. They have slender bodies and round heads with pointed ears. They vary between 1.5 to 2.7 meters, or 5 to 9 feet from head to tail, while males can weigh up to 68 kilograms, or 150 pounds. Females weigh less, topping out at nearly 45 kilograms, or 100 pounds. Their coat is always plain, and typically of a tawny color, though there have been incidences of gray or red cougars. Cougars are born spotted, and their coats fade to pale over time, before finally darkening into their adult colors after the first year of their life. This is thought to be an aid to camouflage. While adult cougars need to blend in with the rocks and desert around them, infants are likely to be hidden in dappled shadows in crevices and underbrush. Historically, mountain lions had the most extensive distribution of all American terrestrial mammals. They ranged from coast to coast in North America, and from southern Argentina and Chile to southeastern Alaska. Extermination efforts, hunting pressure, and habitat destruction have restricted their range to relatively mountainous, unpopulated areas throughout much of their range. Populations in eastern North America were entirely exterminated, except for a small population of Florida panthers. In recent years, populations have begun to expand in areas of human habitation, especially in the western United States. Mountain lions are now fairly common in suburban areas of California and have recently been sighted as far east as urban Kansas City, where several have been hit by cars. The cats may actually see each other once in a while, but mostly they leave messages with feces, urine, scratched logs, or marks they scrape out into the dirt or snow. Mountain lions can also growl, hiss, yowl, and purr to get their message across with other cats, and they are known for a short, high-pitched scream and a whistle-like call. Mountain lions are powerfully built, with large paws and sharp claws. Their hind legs are larger and more muscular than their front legs, which gives them great jumping power. They can run fast and have a flexible spine like a cheetah's to help them maneuver around obstacles and change direction quickly. Even so, mountain lions are mostly ambush predators, launching at prey to knock it off balance. They have especially keen eyesight, and they usually find prey by seeing it move. These cats may be on the prowl during the day or at night, but they are most active at dusk and dawn. Mountain lions hunt over a large area, and it could take a week for one to travel all the way around its home range. They eat a variety of prey depending on where they live, including deer, pigs, capybaras, raccoons, armadillos, hares, and squirrels. Some larger cats even bring down prey as big as elk or a moose, but hunting large prey brings risk, and many mountain lions suffer life-threatening injuries received from a hunt, especially from a prey's sharp horns, antlers, or hoofs. Mountain lions often bury part of their kill to save it for a later meal, hiding the food with leaves, grass, dirt, or even snow, depending on the habitat and time of year. Cougars are particularly vicious, particularly as they have more to fight for. They mate with more than one female, defend large territories that often overlap with those of females, need to hunt, kill, and eat meat more often than females, and do not have the female preoccupation of raising cubs. As such, they come into opposition often, and will sometimes fight to the death over a particular prey animal, female cougar, or path of land. Humans are the biggest predators of cougars with people hunting them for sport and to protect livestock. People are also the main cause of the cats losing their habitats. Out in the wild, wolf packs will prey on the cats because they're able to surround the animal and overwhelm it with numbers. When it comes to a one-on-one -on -one battle, the cougar will usually survive the match. Wolves are most likely to affect cougars by dominating the same territory and taking advantage of prey opportunities. Wolves can also disrupt the cougar's ability to reproduce. 
The feline is not on the endangered species list, but conservation groups remain unsure about how well the cougar population is doing around the world. In the United States, the only state that prohibits hunting them is California. However, it is illegal to hunt them in Costa Rica, Guatemala, Venezuela, Brazil, and throughout most of Argentina. To hunt the big cat in the US, hunters must obtain a permit unless they live in Texas. Poachers target cougars, but the effects of this action on the cat are unknown. The US Fish and Wildlife Service reports that the illegal animal part trade is a $200 million a year market, and it's growing. As you can see, cougars are very strong cats and have amazing qualities, but can they cope in Australia? The biggest cats naturally occurring in Australia are feral domestic cats introduced by Europeans in the last 200 years. Some of these cats have survived very well because they become apex predators without any competition. In remote areas where tribal aborigines still hunt traditionally, feral cats are taken by them as they are very destructive to native marsupials and other small animals. Given the lack of large terrestrial predators, if you take humans out of the picture, the cougars would probably thrive in Australia. They would be the apex predator and feast on all of the kangaroos, wallabies, or anything else it came across. It would be bad news for the dingo, pushing it to only the aridest regions. However, hunting kangaroos would not be a very easy task. Kangaroo has a type of locomotion the cats have never seen before. They are also very fast, can travel up to 80 kilometers an hour, and have tremendous acceleration, getting there very quickly, and are probably the fastest animal over rough and rocky terrain, and up hills where they can be bound very easily. Nothing can match them over long distances. Cougars would likely overheat in the tremendous heat, and with no shade or water energy and fluid management will be vital. So to hunt kangaroos, they have to adapt to the new conditions. Otherwise, they will most likely start feeding on domestic livestock, thus coming into conflict with ranchers. Such a conflict could be tantamount to their disappearance from the mainland. Introducing predators typically end up being more of a problem than a solution. Australia already has major invasive species issues. Introducing cougars may help with controlling kangaroo populations, but may negatively affect a lot of other native populations, including ones that are already vulnerable. It's unlikely that cougars would only hunt and kill kangaroos, and probable that they would kill other species that are already threatened and endangered as well. Although in Australia, cougars should not worry about other predators, they should still be aware of the wildlife hazards such as venomous snakes or even poisonous toads. Cougars would be unfamiliar with these creatures and thus more likely to fall victim to them. That's all for today. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. You can also leave a comment with what you would like to see in the following videos. Thanks for watching. See you next time. time, time, time.